to Jeff Kuenange live here at Citizen Television with the incredible big brain that is Mokisa Kitui. And he's calling it like he sees it, a conversation we need at this time in our history. And yes, a lot of you agree. By the way, Dr. Mukisa Kitui will be at the University of Nairobi tomorrow for a public lecture tomorrow afternoon. If you can catch him there, I'm sure Taifa Hall will welcome you. In the meantime, tweets coming in so thick and so fast from all over the place. Alfred Kiter. I am watching you live. It is impressive and refreshing to realize how Kenya is a great nation with brilliant leaders like Dr. Mukisa Kitui who believe that we are not children of a lesser God. Moses Kuria, MP, got turned to South. He says, I have offered Dr. Mukisa Kitui my running mate position. What does he say? How can a tail wag a dog? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> How does one segue from that? Keep your tweets coming at Koinangi Jeff at Citizen TV Kenya. Hashtag JK Live. Now, um, I'll get to regional integration in a moment, Dr. Ari, and you're an expert in this. But also, before we get to regional integration, the Chinese invasion of Africa and Kenya in particular. Is it an invasion? Good thing, bad thing? Is it? Is Okay, there are two different things that we should look at when you are talking about Chinese and Africa. First of all, the Chinese have now been able to put together the largest portfolio of investable resources beyond their borders in the whole world. Today, the largest FDI flows in the world, particularly in greenfield projects, are from China. And Chinese investment can be the basis of fundamental positive change in a country. China is behind the more than 10% per annum GDP expansion of Ethiopia over the last 10 years. So properly utilized, prefected by a government that does not allow space for people want to inflate the cost of a uh, way of land to be used for infrastructure projects. People who do not want to go and negotiate kickbacks on projects that are good for the society. People who are signing bad contracts. If you exclude the abuse of possibility from your own leaders, you can optimize where you direct Chinese investment. Chinese companies are some of the most competitive winning contracts in Europe, in America, until recently in Asia. But you know, it is a responsibility of a host government to do due diligence on the companies that come to do jobs, to inspect the quality of work being done, and to rein in local thieves who want to pad contracts and loans for their personal gain. At the Road and Belt Forum, which is the highest uh, meeting that is hosted by the Chinese government about the international commercial uh, uh, diplomacy last year, I brought up this to the Chinese government, that since China is exercising zero tolerance to corruption at home, one of the more important things that China can do as a development partner is to help blow a whistle on officials of developing countries who try to steal in projects where the Chinese government is involved. They punish their own. Mm. They should help us to also punish our own. Mm. So they are giving the Chinese government a bad name. So having, having said that, there are some things that governments should not do. I've looked at the SGR in Ethiopia and the SGR in Kenya. There is written in the SGR project in Ethiopia a timed program on training local people to totally take over the operations and maintenance of the train and rolling stock. You have a substantially longer period of Chinese management of this activity in Kenya. To drive a train is not a brainer. The people of my grandfather's generation were doing it here. Mm -hmm. So 
the amount of money being given in management contract is a vote of no confidence in our own people to be able to be managers of rolling stock and the equipment, the machinery. I, I, I think there's some things that can be done. What am I saying? We should not get into this crowd like China is invading us. I know there are some countries where China has arrived in a much more overwhelming way than Kenya by the numbers, by the petty things that they get into. <coughs> Kenya is not in the worst, but we can still hold back and say, what lessons have we learned? The world today is tilting to the east. We must look for FDI flows from Thailand, Indonesia, China, India, but we must learn from past mistakes not be detained by what we did in the past so that all the time we're singing about what was wrong 10 years ago, two years ago. But say, what can we do better? Kenya still needs infrastructure. Kenya still needs SGRs to open up this country's resources. Kenya still needs light transit railway services in Nairobi, soon in other cities. But it's just, can we learn from the mistakes of the past? Even as we look to punish thieves who have convoluted these contracts, can we now structure better government positions when we enter negotiated infrastructure investments? Overall, uh, you mentioned SGR. Overall, good thing, but I think, will it be the game changer that it's touted to be? That is a rather complex debate to get into right now, but I, I think at the end of the day, you have a railway, a, a railway in place now. Maybe it could have been cheaper than it has turned out to be, but it is here. Kenyans will have to pay for the loan of that railway. What we should be doing is say, okay, how can we optimize the resource that we have in spite of the challenges that came with how it arrived, how it was packaged? One, start engaging interesting Uganda for the extension to that territory mm -hmm. to cover some of the cost of this railway line. Two, try to create logical integration between productive areas west of Nairobi with the moving cargo possibilities of the standard railway line. Three, a good railway line without building productive capacity at home makes it easy for others to export things to us. Let the SGR not be for the import of Chinese merchandise to Kenya. Let it be for building productive capacity so that Kenya cheaply exports to the rest of the world. Mm. That's a model that I think we should build around. We should be outraged at poor contracts in the past, but we should not be detained by whether this was done the right way or not, and therefore is the really good or bad. I think that is a sterile discussion. Yeah. You talked about infrastructure being important, lab set project. Uh, I've had my uh, descending views about lab set uh, that um, let us build volume on uh, Mombasa, Nairobi for the time being and see how it goes. South Sudan has uh, slowed down the momentum of Lapset very much. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the initial phase when Lapset was conceived, there was no standard gauge railway and new tarmac road between Addis and Djibouti. And there was no pipeline being constructed between the oil fields of uh, South Sudan and Ethiopia. Yeah. So there are some dynamics that have changed. There was no plan of Uganda shipping its petroleum through Tanzania as it's, it's now being constructed. So a number of major dynamics have changed. If it's economically viable, Lapset should go ahead. But the driving force for Lapset should not be those kleptomaniacs who rushed and bought land where it's supposed to pass, mm -hmm. who are waiting to cash in on Lapset. Yeah. If it is to supply the ego, the theft of those who rushed ahead, the way people scramble for the land of the SGR, I'd rather Lapset does not survive than to extend another debt to Kenyans. Absolutely. And this leads to my next point, which is regional integration. Right. Something that's incredibly, incredibly important mm. if this region is to develop. Right. And, uh, you know, it looks like we take one step forward yeah. and several backwards. Kenya and Ethiopia relationship have really warmed up. Uganda, Rwanda, they were really close at one point. Now they look on, like on the verge of fighting again. L last week I had a, a meeting with President Museveni and I beseeched him as a senior elder leader for this region that he has to go out of his way more than anybody else to make sure that the personal frictions between him and Kagame 
do not translate into a major disruption of the economic integration of this region. Mm. The people of Rwanda, the people of Uganda, have gone through untold pains in the past. They should be the last people to be sentenced to such repeat uh, pogroms. Uh, you told him that? Uh, yes, I did, I did. I did, both pub publicly at the Africa Strategic Leadership Summit and also privately during my bilateral meeting with him. Uh, but, but, but let's look at a number of things. Ten years ago, Kenyan business was excited about East African integration. You are the largest exporters to Uganda. You are exporting more to Uganda than you are importing. You are exporting more to Tanzania than you are, than you are importing. Today, both Tanzania and Uganda export more to Kenya than they import from Kenya. In the case of Uganda, it's partly because of Kenyan entrepreneurs who go to Western Uganda in the land of the Machiga and find fantastic agricultural produce at much better price and better quality than what they find at Sokomjinga. Yeah. And they bring it to supply the Kenyan consumer. Ugandan maize growing in Eastern Uganda has been a major source of quality, low-priced maize for Kenya. Kenya is actually very dependent on maize, import, uh, maize from Uganda. Tanzania the political chemistry between Tanzania and Kenya is wrong. Both sides are finding excuses to slow down commercial engagement. The rhetoric does not help very much. It is in this context that one can understand why President Uhuru is paying a bit more attention to the North on the historical possibilities of engagement between Kenya and Ethiopia. I, I, I think it's positive. There are so many opportunities that can be seen as Ethiopia liberalizes exchange control, opens up telecoms, opens up banking sector, and there's 110 million consumers out there. But hasten with caution. Number one, Ethiopia does not have a minimum wage. The average wage of an Ethiopian working in an export processing zone or in a flower farm is one third of the minimum wage in Kenya. Which means if we just say let the forces of nature work, labor intense production from Ethiopia is going to flood Kenyan market. Secondly, for more than 10 years, Ethiopia has consistently had double digit economic growth. That momentum seems to be even building as they get a very progressive and forward-looking new leader in place. So we should not lose sight of the possibilities of market opening in Ethiopia. But unless you build a momentum of made in Kenya being quality, being competitive, you are going to see a short-term surge and a long-term decline in the benefits of that integration with Ethiopia, just like has happened with some of our near neighbors in this area. Yeah. You are also very close to President Kagame of Rwanda. We have had mutual respect for many years. Correct. And he gets a lot of respect when it comes to his leadership style, even though some critics call him a dictator, right. benevolent, whatever you want to call it. Yes. But. He sees that vision, the Lee Kuan Yew, you know, from third world to first vision, and he said Rwanda will be the next Singapore. Is that what we need sometimes? Do you need a benevolent dictator? I don't know uh, how to put it. First of all, democracy is important as a fallback position for not abusing the rights and dignity of citizens. Democracy is important for reducing the cost of succession, where it does reduce the cost of succession. Mm. But I believe the model of African development requires a developmental state. A developmental state is one where the political leadership is consumed by an obsession that it can rise from where it is and deliver the country to a higher level. And when opportunities come, they are taking a certain. I'll give you a, a good example. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, July, two years ago, I brought Jack Ma and 16 billionaires from China to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. We had a public lecture in Nairobi University. We had a meeting with the business community in Kempinski. We visited Nilab, the, the IHAB, and uh, we visited State House. 
After that, I took him to Kigali. We had a meeting with the cabinet, with President Kagame and his cabinet. And one of the first things that I'd been asking Jack Ma when I brought him to Africa is that I don't want you to use this opportunity to flood Africa with more Chinese merchandise. I want you to help see how can Africa create more market visibility of its produce in China. Mm -hmm. Since then, Kagame followed it up, requested for concrete meetings on what can we do. And last year, Alibaba rolled out the first world electronic trading platform for agricultural produce to be rolled out in Africa in Kigali. And the price of coffee from Rwanda more than doubled in the first three weeks. Wow. Since then, sales have gone up more than 40%. Because there was seen an opportunity, resources were aligned with the opportunity, and the leadership walked the talk. That is a developmental step to me. They may sometimes say, ah, you keep your noises until we are time for election. Mm -hmm. But that's something I'm ready to live with. And no, see uh, a singular obsession with delivering jobs for the young people yeah. and, uh, that the countries have. Using every opportunity to say, our children should not suffer the depravity that our parents suffered. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is, that is a big thing about Kagame. That's a big thing about Mene Zenewi and now Abi in yeah, Ethiopia. Abi Ahmed. Um, was there follow-up from Kenya in the no. same? There's been a lot of follow-up by Kenyan young men and women on their own effort. Mm -hmm. When I arrange courses to be held in Hangzhou, where we have young men and women to see how Alibaba builds electronic market visibility and take people to Taibao villages to see how you can help rural producers of small-scale produce to market their things globally. The young men and women in Kenya borrow money from banks to go on these trips. The government of Rwanda pays for all the Rwandese who qualify to go on these trips. Mm. So there has been follow-up in Kenya but it is by individuals. And that's the difference? That's the difference. Well, at least there's follow-up. Kenya has more than any other country of the people who have been going on this program, but they pay for themselves, every cent. I've read about a dozen tweets to myself and text messages, and to a person, they're saying, this man is very presidential, both intelligence and temperament. The day we stop being tribal with our politics, this is Robert Burale, we will have such a president. I, I believe the, the moment Kenyans stop being transactional, that it's our turn to eat, mm. or that this is the way we can secure easy money, or that we can hire, we can outsource the people who know how to steal through large contracts. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Kitui, but they'll get to have a leader that is worth being a leader of Kenya in the succession. Some others say this is Kenya's, the best president Kenya never had. But those are dead people, they are not alive people. <laughs> <laughs> Your thoughts about the government being in denial that there's a drought and a famine happening up north. Your thoughts, Dr. Ari, as we go to the tweet wall. I, I could say can, the you following. Can you can sit. Uh, first and importantly, I do not have any independent source of information about where the government, mm. what the situation is in Turkana. My colleagues from other UN agencies have gone up there, and in the next one week, I'll be in a position to get the first-hand information from the ground on what is happening. Yeah. But government does not have any defensive interest if there is vulnerability. Government should see what it can do, ask Kenyans and friends of Kenya, to step in and, help and support. So the debate as to where there is or there's no death is not to me the most important one. There is acute drought and starvation mm. and famine in Turkana. How can we mobilize goodwill, even as many of the people in the goodwill community concentrate on the calamities that are happening in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, yeah. but we should be able to say what is the state of play 
and then we cure the challenges that we have. Okay, looks like you want to come and read my tweets with me. Are you okay there? Yeah. I can read them for you. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go to the tweets. P. Nemuel says, whoever thinks that reports of deaths <coughs> as a result of drought in Turkana and Baringo is fake, he himself is a vampire. Ouch. People should not politicize this. Humanity must be respected. All right. What's your point of view? Gian Wahome says, this is the only country where brilliant minds like that of Mokisa Kitui cannot be president because of our ethnic politics. Sad. Indeed. Nyakwar Otiende Bungu says, it's true lives are being lost. These contradictions are coming since it isn't campaign time. If it were, then all roads would have headed there. Since we have not less than two years to election, not even a single minute of attention is given. Our leaders are our enemies. Wow. Kiri 22. It shouldn't be a question of if people are dying of hunger. Rather, it should be why the citizens of a democratic country that is more than half a century old be facing or dealing with the risks of starvation. True that. Ronald Mayaka. Dr. Kitui is speaking a lot of sense. Kenya has brains that can salvage her from her current predicament. But are they utilized? No, they are demonized instead. Sad. Mm. Karani Mutonga says, we reject great leaders like Dr. Mukisa Kitui and export them only to be left scraping the bottom of the barrel for a leader with integrity. Sometimes I think we deserve the mess we are in. We are to blame <laughs> to True. get what we deserve, Dactari, <laughs> someone once said. SMS is Sir Nixon Dungire Dungire kin from Kinder Kinderuma. Uh, oh, okay. You just took that away. Joseph Bowak from Kibra Sub County. Dr. Kitui, we are aware our judiciary is a weak link in the fight against i guess it's corruption because what we see in the judgments on corruption cases what does you what do you recommend they say judiciary is the weakest link you want my response to that yes you know um, democracy matures with building strong institutions for governance we have emphasized very much the development of the political arm of government. But we must see that the administrative arm and the judicial arm also get strengthened. They evolve over time. They are going through their first phase, but we have to start seeing what have been the inherent weaknesses. We made a mistake in assuming that if the judiciary is independent, that on its own automatically makes it a good judiciary. Yeah. I've got Sakaja Johnson here has just sent a text saying Mukisa got me thinking. About what, Senator? What, what are you thinking, Senator? Just give us your thoughts. Paul from Nakuru, Daktari Mukisa, you make me proud to be a Kenyan even in these dark days of mega corruption. Too bad your own country cannot realize that we have lost you to the diaspora. <laughs> Have we lost you to the diaspora, Dr. Ari? You know, incidentally, the Kenyan diaspora is a, uh, is a model diaspora. Even those who have built homes and will retire and live and die abroad still send money to Kenya. Mm. They, they vote confidence with their resources. So uh, that diaspora is important. But we should replenish it by showing that they should be proud of what is going on at home. Yeah. Jomo GG from Mukuruini. Kitui's revelation of tourist MCAs and their spendthrift culture is a big national shame. Taxpayers are siphoned their blood to the very last drop. Shame, shame, shame. So true. It's not just shopping they go to for clothes, they shop for other things. But we'll leave it at that for now. A lot of people are also suggesting you should write a book. You mentioned earlier on that you've been j jotting down some notes for your memoirs. Are you working on a book? I, I don't know if it should be memoirs. No, um... You know, I, uh, I've been writing down, keeping my own notes about um, a, a promise sabotaged. The dynamics of national renewal that were rising in the 1980s mm. and we witnessed through the politics of the 1990s 
particularly the content of our message as the so-called Young Tax, and how we have actually seen the reincarnation of, of uh, YK92. Um, it's a failure on uh, those in the vanguard of national renewal. And where did we lose it? What are the challenges that the millennials should try to, to pick up and follow through? And these are issues that consume me a lot. I've been uh, writing to myself, maybe to clarify to myself, but maybe one day I can convert it to public uh, statement of my opinions uh, for others also to, to, to think and talk about it. One day would you want to run for president? I have not quite decided. I might, but I have not quite decided. At least we'll keep that window open. Yes. Tomorrow, lecture at University of Nairobi? Yes. And then you're off? Yes, tomorrow I have uh, this, um, you know, uh, some of the things I've been talking about uh, re represent the failure of nationalism. The, 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 the dreams, the celebrations we had at independence, mm. that when we identify as nationalists, as Kenyan nationalists, uh, that that is the road towards national salvation. And I think that nationalism has been getting a bad name because where proto-nationalism, or call it tribalism, competes with national identity, mm. always it subverts what is it, the collective, what is it about us. At a time when borders are going down and there's more competition from people from other countries legitimately looking for jobs that you're also looking for in your own country, where does the identity of the Kenyan stand? Mm. What is patriotic to do? So uh, the, the frame of my public lecture tomorrow is uh, beyond nationalism on the quest for uh, a new patriotism. Wow. Uh, as we see nationalism turning tribal in Europe and America, maybe we should look at uh, a new ways of rallying our consciousness and dedication. And this is the subject around which I'm speaking tomorrow afternoon at three o'clock in Nairobi University. Fantastic. Uh, I'm also rolling out a training program for economists, as I told you. Yeah. Uh, we are doing this with Nairobi University and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We roll this out for Africa on Monday next week. And then I am going to a cabinet retreat with the president and ministers of Botswana with a small team of advisors uh, later on in the week. Yeah. Goodness gracious me. Fantastic, Doctor. Keep doing what you do. If we don't appreciate you here, then go do what you do wherever you do it. Silas Jakakimba. PA to uh, former Prime Minister. He mm. says, it's always so refreshing listening to Kenya's export number one, Dr. Kitui. He says, whereas in, I'm aligned to this opinion that Kenya has many Kitui residents here, I still believe that as a country we need to think and ser seriously how we as a people, a nation, can create space for him once he leaves Unktad. It's not my province though, Jeff, to attempt to suggest the pedestals at which Kenya could land him on return. He makes me proud. He awakens. Dr. Mukisa Kitui. Tell him, Erokamano Jathurwa. Erokamano Aenya. Yeah. I think Sakaja has uh, tweeted again. Uh, he says, he needs to give me a paragraph in his book. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's always good when you inspire people, Doctor. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you very All much. All the very best to you. Dr. Mukisa Kitui, folks, keep tweeting at Krenanga Jeff at Citizen TV Kenya. The hashtag is JK Live. I hope you have been as inspired as we have here. Dr. Mukisa Kitui says, keep making noise. Eventually, we will be heard. Do not get tired of calling a thief what he is a thief. We'll get there someday. Tomorrow morning, join Professor Hamo and myself on the hottest breakfast show in all of Africa. Hashtag Jeff and Hamo on Hot on Hot 96 from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And we'll see you back here next Wednesday night. You know, if it's Wednesday, it's all about those three letters on the keyboard that follow each other, namely JKL, right here on Citizen Television, 9 p.m. every Wednesday. Thanks so much for being a part of the show. Good night, good luck, and God bless this great nation of ours called Kenya.